firstly welcome. This is the first of the Research and Evidence Facilities new series of webinars. And for those of you who don't know the Research and Evidence Facility or the REF as we refer to it, it's a research consortium led by South the University of London with the University of Manchester also in the UK and Sahan in Nairobi. And it's been established by the EU Emergency Trust Fund for Africa to conduct independent research into migration, displacement and development in the Great Horn of Africa region and to generate new evidence and policy relevant knowledge. Please see our website for more details. I won't try and expand on it more now. So my name is Oliver Bakewell and I'm part of the REF team leading research on migration development. And I'm based at the Global Development Institute at the University of Manchester. And in today's webinar, we're focusing on the themes of resilience and environmental change. The REF has recently published two studies exploring different sides of the relationships between livelihoods, mobility and environment. One examines rural urban livelihoods in Laikipia country, country, sorry, county. The other looks at resilience and environmental variability in Takana. Both happen to be focused on Kenya, but the issues they raise are likely to resonate in other parts of the region and beyond. So we felt this webinar would be a good chance to present this work and discuss some of the common themes arising in the two studies. Just gonna explain how, how it's going to run and introduce the speakers. We have so we have three speakers, each making short introductions today. First, Caitlin Sturridge will talk about her study, Moving in Context of Environmental Change, a Rural Urban Livelihood Study, or a Rural Urban Livelihood Perspective from Laikipia, Kenya. So Caitlin is the research coordinator for the REF and is based at Sahan in Nairobi. She's also doing a PhD at SARS, conducting research into the links between mobility, livelihoods and environment. And this study in Laikipia draws on fieldwork undertaken for her PhD. Next, Greta Semplici will present her study, Resilience in Action, Local Practices and Development in Humanitarian Policies. Greta is a Max Weber Fellow at the European University Institute working on resilience, pastoralism, mobility, and development. And this study draws on the in-depth fieldwork she undertook as part of the PhD, her PhD at the University of Oxford. Greta comes from a background as an economist trained at the University of Florence, but her PhD, I think, moved her quite a lot closer to anthropology. And after these two presentations on the, these papers, we'll have some responses from Charles Tonnery, He's environmental science researcher and research fellow at the African Centre for Technology Studies, where he supports research and policy analysis under the Climate Resilience Economies Programme. He's also a co-convener of policy impact discussions under the Africa Research and Impact Network, ARIN. Another thing he is doing is he's involved in work with the Nairobi Risk Hub, which supports Nairobi City to develop evidence-based city-led integrated disaster management plan. So, I'll pass on now to Caitlin to make her presentation. Okay, so hi everyone. My name is Caitlin Sturridge and as Oliver mentioned, I'm a research coordinator on the REF and I'm in the third year of my PhD at SOAS. Okay, so I'm going to um, talk a little bit today about a report that I wrote for the REF, uh, which looks at how people are moving, um, but I guess also living their livelihoods in context of environmental change. And I want to present um, maybe an alternative perspective of what that might look like in practice. Um, and I'm gonna do that by uh, looking at something that I've called a rural urban livelihood, which broadly speaking is a livelihood that is mobile, diversified, plural, and spans, sim spans multiple rural and urban settings simultaneously. Um, but before going into that, I just wanted to uh, I guess, get a sense of how we think about migration when we think about migration and environment. And one of the things that, one of the things that we tend to think about, well, I actually starting again, I, I put into Google um, migration and environment to see what kinds of images came up um, and to see what kinds of images were reflected in our, in our common assumptions around how people move in context of environmental change. And the four images on the slide came up and I think, as you can see, they suggest a certain kind of migration or mobility, 
a mobility which is inherently forced with a focus on this idea of environmental refugee, climate refugee, and similar kinds of language. There's also this sense of a kind of migration that is permanent. Uh, there's this sense of a rupture with one's place of origin, a difficulty or even impossibility of returning to one's place of origin as conditions in that place become increasingly in inhospitable. There's also this sense of a migration that is crossing borders, um, long distance migration, crossing international borders and possibly in the direction of Europe. So I guess while it's important to firstly mention that this is the reality for many people who move, and this is the reality probably for, man for many more people um, going forwards as the impacts of climate change become increasingly apparent. But there's also another kind of reality of how people move in contexts of environmental change. Um, it's a reality that is maybe, I guess it emerges out of a complex mix of choice and coercion, not inherently forced. It's also a, a kind of mobility that is internal, not necessarily crossing international borders, but staying within um, countries. It's closely embedded in livelihood decisions and it's, it's compelled by a multi-causality, so not just environment alone, but actually a range of different factors come together to co-produce this kind of movement. So a quick slide on methodology. I'll try and be quick on this one. The report that I wrote um, comes from my own field research in Lycipia, which I conducted over an eight-month eight period in 2019. The research looked at five main locations, which you can see circled in the map on the right hand side and around 100 interviews were conducted as well as focus group discussions and life histories. One of the main reasons that attracted me to Lycipia was this um, mixed climatic zone. So you have a range of semi-humid and semi-arid climatic zones within the county as well as a cross section of society. You have people and communities involved in a mix of pastoralism, farming, trading, business. Um, there are large commercial farms um, and a range of different small towns and trading posts with which to focus the research on. Another reason for looking at, at Lycipia was that environmental change has become a significant issue for many people residing within the county, be that in the north or the south, or engaged in a range of different kinds of livelihood activities. I guess when you think about environmental change within Lycipia, water, is one of the main issues that people are affected by. There's been a significant change in the timing and the intensity of the rain of the of the rainfall. Um, and there's also been a significant depletion in river water levels. So some river, some rivers have deplete, been depleted by as much as 80% in some cases. So it's perhaps not surprising that 85% of respondents identified water as the major challenge facing their livelihood. But at the same time, when migrants were asked the reasons for their movements, only 12% identified water as the reason for moving. So this tells us that while water is the main issue in Lycipia, there are a range of different factors which come together to co-produce movements. And you can see some of those on the slide. So there's rainfall, there's river water depletion, but there's also privatization of land. Land has become increasingly privatized and fenced off. And this is an issue that goes back to the colonial e era and has continued, um, has continued until the present day in many cases. There's also a general sense of economic decline. So there's increased taxation, there's a legacy of the structural adjustment programs of the 1980s, and there's also a context of um, financial mismanagement. But it's not just challenges which are encouraging people to, or urging, obliging people to move there's also a number of uh, opportunities, uh, a number of, um, I guess, improvements within the socioeconomic fabric of life, which has encouraged people to move. There have been, in, there's been improvements in the transport and communications, the proliferation of matatus, minibuses, um, Boda Boda motorbikes, uh, M-Pesa mobile money, smartphones. Uh, all of these changes have um, significantly, significantly facilitated people's ability to move. There are also gender and generational changes. So it's become increasingly socially acceptable for women and young people to move more than ever before. So 
So in this context, what does this tell us about the kinds of movement that is occurring within Lycipia? It tells us that movement occurs out of a complex mix of choice and coercion, both opportunities and challenges, and moves us away somewhat from this idea of the environmental refugee. It also underlines that mobility is there's a, there's a multi-causality to mobility. It's not just about the environment. You can't isolate or extrapolate the environment, but there's a web of factors that come together to co-produce movements, social, political, economic, cultural, um, and so on. So turning now to this idea of rural urban livelihoods. As I said in the first slide, rural urban livelihoods are a, um, their livelihoods that I guess are, they're mobile, they're diversified, they're plural, and they're livelihoods that successfully span multiple rural, rural and urban locations simultaneously. And there's two ways that you could really look at rural urban li livelihoods. You can look at them through movements, and on the next slide I'll show how you can look at them through connections. So starting with the first, this idea of looking at them through movements, this is the idea that as livelihoods come under growing pressure, um, pressures that we looked at on the previous slide, households are increasingly looking to diversify their livelihoods across different kinds of activities. So that might be pastoralism, it might be farming, it might be trading business and so on. But the resources on which people rely in order to make their livelihoods are, une are unevenly distributed across rural and urban settings. So for example, in a rural area, you're more likely to be able to access natural resources upon which some livelihoods depend, such as water, land, and pasture. And in cities and towns, you're more likely to be able to access job markets, basic services, um, yeah, markets, employment opportunities, and so on. So while some people are able to diversify their livelihoods in situ, in place, many households, or at least some people within many households, are obliged to move elsewhere in order to diversify their livelihoods. And this is what you can see in the map on the right hand side. It represents the livelihood pattern of a 58 year old respondent in pastoral Olampa, which is in, in the north of the county. And he explained to me how in the past his livelihood had traditionally uh, revolved around subsistence pastoralism. But due to a range of different uh, challenges that he was facing, him and his family were increasingly looking to diversify their livelihood across different kinds of activities. And they'd successfully managed to do this. They'd managed to um, become engaged in subsistence pastoralism, but also chicken farming, the trading of various goods and services at a range of different markets, and also a reliance on remittances from relatives, relatives of theirs who had moved abroad, uh, not moved abroad, moved, moved, moved elsewhere. Um, and the way and the reason that they were able to do this was that this respondent, his wife and his children moved on a regular basis between six rural and urban locations, which you can see identified on the map. So what does this tell us? It tells us something about movements. It tells us that movements are internal, they're short distance and they're bi-directional, which is again quite different from the images that we saw on the first slide. It also tells us something about livelihoods. Mobility is an, is an increasingly important component of many contemporary livelihoods. Livelihoods are also plural and involving multiple different activities and they are spanning multiple rural and urban locations as well. So we've looked at rural urban livelihoods in the context of movements, but we can also look at them in the context of connections. So the people involved and the kinds of threads that connect them to one another. This is perhaps encapsulated in the image on the right hand side of the screen. Don't worry too much about all the individual boxes, but the main gist of this image is that the respondent who is the um, represented by the circle with the number one in it, a 68 year old subsistence farmer and labor who I interviewed in rural Baraka. She was um, able to stay connected with five of her six children who had moved elsewhere and they'd moved to a range of rural and urban locations. You can see the urban locations in blue and the rural locations in green in the numbers two, three, four, five, six, and seven. So this, um, this respondent, she led a, an extremely precarious 
existence. She was living on less than one dollar a day. She had very little land to speak of. She had only a few small livestock and she was extremely, almost completely reliant on the connections that she was able to sustain with um, people who had moved, with relatives of hers who had moved elsewhere. But there was also a sense of reciprocity. So it wasn't just that they were sending her money um, and, and it was a one way um, relationship. Just like many other non-migrants, she was supporting um, her relatives who had moved abroad with other, with other aspects. It might be money, but it might also be looking after their property and their assets, uh, keeping their farm going in their absence, looking after children. So there's a bi-directionality in terms of this kind of support. But this image also shows you that you can be involved in a rural urban livelihood without actually having to move yourself. This respondent had stayed in an urban area, in a rural area, sorry, most of her life, but her livelihood revolved around both rural and urban activities as a result of the connections that she was able to sustain with relatives and children who had moved elsewhere to urban settings. So what does this tell us? It tells us that we need to think more broadly than just physical migration. We need to be thinking about mobility in its broadest sense, including the connections that migrants and non-migrants are able to sustain with one another. It also highlights this idea that livelihoods are more than just an activity. A livelihood is more than just pastoralism or farming, for example. It's also often about the connections that people are able to sustain with others, particularly for marginalized groups who are unable to engage in their own activities and must rely on the activities of others in order to sustain themselves. Um, thirdly, this, this idea of these rural urban livelihoods seen through connections, they, they also highlight the idea that livelihoods are relational and collective. They encompass and they bring, bring into consideration a range of different people um, living in different locations, coming together to support one another and share their resources. Uh, I'm not sure how much time I've got, but this is my last slide. Um, so what does, this, what does all of this tell us when it comes to policy and um, programs? I think it tells us four main things. Um, firstly, mobility represents an important livelihood, livelihood option for growing numbers of households, whether that be physical movements or the connections that migrants and non-migrants are able to sustain with one another. Policy and programs should therefore seek to support rather than deter these forms of mobility. A second implication for policy is that movements emerge from a complex mix of choice and coercion and are co-produced by a range of social, economic, cultural, political and environmental factors. With this in mind, policy and programmes should seek to recognise the complexity and diversity of these experiences by incorporating political economy and historical analyses into their planning. Thirdly, rural and urban areas are closely connected to one another rather than being isolated entities. Policy and programmes should therefore take into account the often unintended consequences that an intervention in one location can have on communities residing elsewhere. This can be seen as an opportunity as it suggests that the potential scope and reach of interventions goes beyond the primary target per se. Finally, and fourthly, households are diversifying their livelihoods across a mix of different activities. Labels such as farmer, pastoralist, or trader that focus on a particular activity don't capture this, and they overlook the array of different activities upon which contemporary livelihoods, sorry, contemporary households rely. Likewise, categories like rural and urban treat these places and populations as distinct entities without recognizing the connections between them. This suggests that labels and categories that focus on a primary live, livelihood activity a singular residence, whether that be rural or urban, or a specific breadwinner, risk overlooking the array of secondary, tertiary, and additional activities, people, and places that contribute to contemporary livelihoods. Okay, good uh, afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending this webinar. And as Oliver said, I'm my name is Greta Semplici, and I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the European University. Institute. Um, I'm not an expert on environmental change or climate change per se, so what I'll try to talk you today is the unfolding debate about how environmental change is impacting 
livelihoods in the dry lands, in particular uh, pastor pastoral livelihoods, and what are the policy responses through the resilience agenda. And this is based on my PhD research in Turkana County in the Northern Kenyan dry lands, and I'm drawing from a study I did for the REF called um, Resilience in Action. So basically, I start with a very quick uh, location of the debate of resilience and environmental change to then move to show how this brought a renewed attention to the dry lands and what sorts of underlying questions this shift in attention sort of um, hide. I then survey the responses to this uh, question to show how, uh, despite policy changes, problems remain and conclude uh, with uh, some basic premises of free thinking our presence in the uh, dry lands. So very quickly here, we all know that resilience is pervasive in scholarly and policy circles with roots in ecology science and psychology, which then expanded to many other disciplines of scientific inquiry until it became a key political category of our time, uh, being endorsed by policymakers and the A industry. And within this context, the greatest usage of resilience lies in the field of environmental change and, and climate change. So how has this translated uh, for the context of the dry land? In this table here, I'm um, summarizing the dry lands, sorry, which are the um, largest uh, land category on, uh, on Earth. And the key feature that I want to dry, try attention to um, here is dry lands variability. So the scientific community now knows that dry lands are structurally variable, where variability entails that key resources and, and nutrient, as nutrients and waters for livestock can be relied in the form of unpredictable and short-lived concentrations more than uniform and stable distribution. So in this context, vegetation and water resources, as well as other resources besides the uh, socio-ecological realm, aid, uh, market prices, infrastructure development, these are ephemeral in time and patchy in space. So this key feature of drylands meant that pastoral livelihoods have to specialize to a highly variable and unpredictable resource endowment through, for example, health flexibility, diversity, um, and mobility among another bunch of mechanisms, which I'll review later on. And because of these two measure, because of these two characteristics, drylands variabilities and uh, the pastoral adaptive behavior, dry lands have been subject to major misconceptions that have sadly seen, in my opinion, new life since the rise of climate change concerns, which I'm in this table. Uh, so this table is summarizing the, the, the debate of the different views about dry lands and um, pastoral livelihoods, which I don't have time to go through in, in, in detail. Uh, but what I want to underline is this last uh, row, uh, so that we basically have recently seen an, um, a renewed interest toward the, the, the dry lands in policy making circles following a period of pastoral crisis, which uh, was dependent on development failures and donor withdrawal from the, from the dry lands. And this renewed interest that we observe now is following the increasing concerns about climate change and the urge to increase, um, uh, to build resilient communities to extreme weather events. So climate change did contribute to the revival of dry, of dry lands, but the language employed is still one of fragility, coping, scarcity. So pastoralism, that since the 80s have been revalued as uh, adaptive, opportunistic, and, uh, and rational is now perhaps facing some sorts of limits because of the challenges posed by uh, climate change. So underneath the, the revival of the dry land in a context of climate change, I think that lies this um, hidden question, where, uh, which is whether there is a limit, a threshold to the pastoralist adaptive capacities. And I believe that this question is so, sort of bringing the debate backward to 40 years ago when variability was essentially treated as a problem and is also marking an, an incompatibility between local responses and global problems in the line that if 
uh, desertification debates that in the 70s uh, brought the first international attention to the drylands, if these desertification debates were considered a problem of local degradation and therefore local responses could be valuable as the paradigm shift in the 80s managed to uh, reaffirm by defining pastoral livelihood as um, adaptive and, and rational. The problem that we are facing now, a global ch a climate change problem is, is, a, is a global problem and therefore also as adaptive livelihoods as pastoral livelihoods may no longer be viable. And to this debate, uh, to this question, there are two um, main competing narratives. Uh, the first one goes with many, and especially the UN literature, which believes that this is the end of pastoralism, which is not necessarily what they say straightforward, but it's what we get as a message from the programs that they fund, increased mechanization of agriculture, increased irrigation schemes, the greening of the Sahara, um, infrastructural development, conservation programs, social protection programs with a food or a cash transfer component, education programs. These are all uh, programs which aim to generate opportunities for a new livelihood activity that is less vulnerable to the impact of droughts and other shocks. And I'm quoting a, a World Bank report here now. While on the other hand, many believe that net of policy restrictions, pastoral is not only is locally well positioned to face environmental change, but also it can have an important role to play in terms of global lessons of management of uncertainty and that other livelihoods, generally more sedentary ones, are more likely to fail. Under this uh, view, there is a recognition that climate change itself is the representation of variability. And therefore, there is a great deal that we can learn from pastoral livelihoods who have always managed variability through, for example, some of the resilience practices which we review in the REF study such as strategic mobility, uh, flexible and communal land tenor, uh, herd diversification, mechanism of reciprocity and complementarity between different livelihood groups. In other words, they are, they are approaching, they are employing a large scale approach to space and to social economy by means of mobility. And here I'm kind of linking with Caitlin's presentation on mobility, which is broadly conceived as movement through a wide scale territory uh, but also in terms of connections and relationship, relationships which tie the socioeconomic fabric of the dry land. And one other thing that we are observing is that in this context of further environmental change, which climate change is displaying, people are rethinking their livelihood strategies. They are changing live, live, livestock species from cattle to goats to camels. They're changing their crop choices from maize to sorghum. Uh, They're changing the overall strategy, strengthening complementarities and relationships with other livelihood groups. Herd mobility is becoming even more um, important. So I think that what I'm trying to say is that pastoral, the pastoralists are adapting their adaptive capacities. But unfortunately, uh, policy prescriptions kind of fail to keep up with such dynamism, reproposing same solutions and recasting pastoralism at that end. And this is what I believe is causing the greatest source of um, vulnerability, restrictions to move across different territories, to access resources, to trade across borders, is limiting the capacity of pastoral livelihoods to operate effectively and in turn determining their, their vulnerability. And therefore, the answer to the questions about the limits of pastoral livelihoods may even be sadly affirmative, but the reason is political and not environmental. So pastoral livelihoods are not vulnerable to climate change, they're vulnerable to the fact that there is no longer access to land in a context of climate change in which access to land may be even more important. So with the REF um, study, we uh, try to unpack these policies, these resilience policies in the context of climate change, drawing from the case of Turkana County. And we did see um, changes, it's not that everything has remained uh, the same. This, uh, these changes mainly are at the level of 
organizational structure of the agencies in the design and evaluation phases. We have seen a great um, new bunch of policies which refer to the paradigm shifts in views about dry land and, um, and pastoral livelihoods. And, and the Kenyan case is actually quite interesting and because it's, it's, it's very progressive in a way, there is a new constitution with the word pastoralist in it, which is, uh, I'd say, um, impressive. And a bunch of other uh, policy uh, frameworks, um, which all go in the direction to recognize the value and the potential of the arid lands and, uh, and pastoral livelihoods. But nonetheless, uh, there are problems remain when these policies are translated in practice. And we, um, we reviewed problems at, at three levels, at an implementation level, so in the actual uh, budgeting of, um, of intervention and in, in inconsistency between uh, national frameworks of neighboring states, uh, also within uh, competing, objective, of competing objectives within the, the national state. Uh, at a second level of more practical or let's say um, propositional level, in terms of what interventions are then actually funded, which are basically uh, still the same, trainings, transfers, services, and uh, infrastructure. And a third level of a mindset level uh, of problems. And let me spend a few words here because we've seen that in the resilient interventions in dry lands in the context of climate change, a lot of programs have a food component for example, which is anchored to narratives of food insecurity, of chronic food insecurity, which reveals that assumptions of pastoral and rangeland low productivity are yet to be overcome. These are also, um, there is also a disaster planning component, which is based on a linear timeline around which a state series of risk management measures are deployed, information, monitoring, insurance, while the world we inhabit, we've seen is largely messy. Uh, a component of this planning normally is, for example, the early warning system, which still work under the premise that instability is a problem. So they kind of flag out all the events that happen in the region, but they flag it out, not with the intent to, to benefit from it, but to the intent, with the intent to uh, put in place um, uh, to build preparedness in a very conservative way, uh, in trying to uh, you know, prevent and, and control whatever is about to happen. While this is what we have to reverse thinking. They have also uh, conservation plans or irrigation schemes, agricultural development components, which basically result in the alienation of pastoral land and reveal the continued misconception of pastoral land use. And often many programs have also a formal education component, which basically undermine uh, pastoral culture and knowledge system. And it's based on the assumption that educated pastoralists will settle and find better jobs, which is anyway seldom the case, and modernize. And therefore this reveals the continued assumptions about the unsustainability of pastoralism and, and then no, no, no longer being viable. So to conclude, we basically need a radical rethink um, about our presence in the, dry land, in the dry lands, for which I'm putting here some basic premises. Um, first and, uh, and most importantly, we need to accept variability and make it um, a governance principle. So we have seen that pastoral systems specialize in exploiting short-lived concentrations of resources, characteristics of unstable environment, and then in a, market, in a perfect market context, if this is the realm in which we want to operate, uh, uh, we would have somehow developed innovations <laughs> of some sort to benefit from this context. And I'm talking here of a governance system, of an infrastructure, of a technology, which is built on a way to gain from uh, viability, which is, and I really wonder why this is not happening in this context, while it's happening in all our dim other dimensions of our, our, of our lives in which we, there is this fast-paced uh, race to innovation while we are still the same <laughs> for what concerns the presence in the dry land. We need to understand that even in the, con in the context of a global problem such as climate change, 
uh, the local is instructive, which means uh, we, we need to integrate pastoralist knowledge and expertise, not only because they are uh, valuable informants because of their presence in, dry, in, in the drylands, but because their knowledge and practice and livelihoods changes to interface the changes in the broader context, which means that we have to understand that their livelihood and their culture is not static, it's not traditional, but it evolves. And by understanding how it changes, we may also understand better what is changes in the context, including environmental changes and climate change. And finally, to conclude, we need to be very careful about um, univocal um, narrative of climate change, not because climate change is not important, but because this should be understood in a context of high variability and also in relations with political and uh, economic factors that are co-responsible in creating risks and, and dangers for pastoral livelihoods. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Caitlin and um, Greta. Um, okay, so I'm now going to call upon Charles to uh, make a few comments of response. Yeah, uh, th thank you so much, uh, Oliver. As, um, I'll react uh, to uh, Caitlin and uh, Greta's um, uh, presentation, but also I'll share the perspectives and um, experience uh, having spent almost a decade undertaking uh, or participating in community-based uh, studies focused on adaptation in Africa and of course um, supporting learning uh, using the Africa Research and Impact Network. So I'll respond from a researcher policy practice and learning uh, perspective. I, I think we can acknowledge uh, that uh, Kathleen and Akreta have brought in especially one of the key findings uh, from their study that uh, there is a multi-causality uh, to the different uh, changes or, or change of livelihoods and of course, disruption of livelihood movement from rural to urban in their studies, in, in their reports. And, and, and from the perspective, um, from the perspective that I look at it is that um, research in Africa, I think largely we have been focused in terms of uh, narrow. We need actually to emphasize especially to look at the, what are the multiple re, uh, causes and how are those uh, causes really interplay in terms of disrupting the uh, livelihoods. Of course, um, uh, Greta has warned us not to look at only climate change, but when you look at 2020, especially the first uh, three months, uh, the East Africa really faced uh, triple threats. Uh, there was COVID, there was locust invasion and floods, and you look at how really disrupted especially uh, the, the institutions and resource allocation and reactions uh, from researcher to, to, to government uh, programs. So that is actually an highlight that I think uh, Kathleen has brought in very strongly. Uh, when it comes to their policy implication, or especially of their finding, and of course the different studies that we are also supporting, I, I think um, we need to be very uh, cautious in terms of look, looking at the policies. I currently doing uh, what you call uh, doing policy mapping, especially on disaster risk reduction and management uh, for Nairobi city as a disaster risk policy. And then realize there are more policies that we need to look at when you're really uh, looking at the policy implication of different studies. Uh, one, for instance, uh, Kathleen, uh, Greta, you brought in especially, and also Kathleen, you brought in the, the policy implication. But I, did, I, don't, I don't know if you managed to look at the Community Lands Act. How is really how is the impact the operationalization of the Community Lands Act impacting on the different uh, power relations, the contestations, the conflicts around land and resource access among the pastries and the new uh, different livelihoods, especially the businesses and sedentary lifestyle that is coming into those uh, regions. Also, the agricultural policy. I think the government has got a program called the Big Four Agenda. So did you manage to look at the big four agenda? What are the political aspirations that the governments or the politicians really want to achieve within a particular space? And what is the implication of some of the findings on the final phase of the implementation of the big four agenda? So there is need also to look at the regional policies. How is it linking, linked to especially agenda 2063? Can it be a motivation? Your findings, can it really motivate the African governments and especially 
the regions which are basically in the semi-arid places to really uh, uh, take up the lessons. In practice, um, in, in, in your study, of course, you've mentally focused especially on the on the households. Uh, in terms of stakeholder engagement, you have found also that it's very critical to engage especially with the technical staffs at the government level, port, uh, the private sector, and the government, because remember, they are play a very critical link in terms of supporting the implementation of the policy and also leveraging the knowledge uh, from the local uh, community. So it will be very important to also in the in, in the future engagement, the webinars that you're going to organize, to, to pick some of the uh, technical staff from the regions that you really uh, did your study. In terms of learning, I, I think, uh, there was the issue of uh, knowledge management, the integration of pastoralist uh, knowledge and expertise, which uh, Creta you brought in very strongly. We were discussing actually at the Development Partners Forum is chaired by His Excellency, the Deputy President of Kenya. And I was submitting the position of the think tanks in non-state actors in Kenya. And we were discussing with the Permanent Secretary of Agriculture about the knowledge management. When, what is the, some of the recommendations that you think you can still go further in your study that you think you can submit? Because this one is an open space in terms of, uh, remember the extension services uh, kind of um, went slow and kind of got disrupted, but then how can we revive knowledge management from the local level in terms of supporting and uh, leveraging of the research output and of course upscaling uh, the, the indigenous uh, knowledge and the local uh, knowledge. And, and, and lastly, in terms of addressing the uncertainties, I think um, both of you, you brought in, um, especially, uh, we are treating pastoralism in some aspects as kind of going to support the adaptation within the context of semi-arid, and also it's going to die at some point. So that kind of um, uh, situation, we really need to look at um, mobilizing the physical and social scientists and different stakeholders to really dialogue around, especially addressing the uncertainties, not only in the same areas, but also those livelihoods which are being transitioned from uh, island areas to, 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 to pastoral areas. Because you look at the irrigation system, the technology is really moving in very fast, especially the deprecation. So what's the implication of deprecation, especially on the uh, pastoralism and the different livelihoods? And then uh, lastly, uh, we like to really um, echo, especially the research and evidence facility team for initiating this kind of webinars. And at the Africa Research and Impact Network, we did start especially monthly series, um, seminar series. We normally have also weekly uh, preview and annual conferences. We are anticipating to have a book in this uh, first quarter on COVID and uh, impact on the different sectors. And we look forward especially to build synergy and address especially the issues that are emerging from Africa. But of course, not forgetting especially the aspiration of Africa under the agenda uh, 2063 and strengthening especially the Anglophone and Francophone regions in Africa. Thank you so much, Oliver and Kreta and Kathleen and the, and the delegates in the, this webinar. Thank you so much. Right. Thank you very much, Charles, and thank you for keeping to time. Um, we had the time at the end and you kept perfectly to it. Um, okay, so could I ask uh, Greta and Caitlin um, if we can get them up on the screen as well? And um, I don't know if you maybe take a couple of minutes each to respond to Charles, but also there's some, been some points raised in the chat. Um, particularly about um, the, uh, the unintended consequences between interventions in rural and urban areas and how they interact. Um, I think, Caitlin, you've responded to that in the chat. I don't know if you want to say anything more on that. Um, if you can respond very quickly, I know we have at least one, one question um, about pastoralism that will come to you, Greta, in a minute. But first, um, yeah, first you respond to Charles and any, any other points from the chat. Caitlin first, do you want to go? Yep, sorry, I, yep. Um, so I guess one point that I can respond to on Charles's um, comments, and thanks very much for them, Charles. They were really, um, really insightful and really useful to think about 
um, in, a in a wider kind of broader sense. Um, you mentioned the Community Lands Act and the Big Four Agenda. I guess with my research, I haven't specifically, um, they didn't specifically crop up um, the Community Lands Act to a smaller extent um, with the pastoral communities that I was interviewing in the North. Um, but I think your point speaks to this wider issue of recognizing, I guess, different scales. It's not just about the individual assets or resources or experiences of a particular community, but trying to embed those within wider policy dynamics that are going on. Um, and I guess within the context of Lycipia, there's quite a lot of policy implications that go back historically and are continuing up until the present day. I think issues around land and policies and um, interventions around land have had a significant impact on the way that people move and the way that they uh, manage their livelihoods. Um, resettlement projects, um, bringing in um, large numbers of landless um, farmers back in the 1960s and bringing them into the county had a significant impact on, um, I guess, the kind of the makeup of the county, uh, the kinds of livelihoods that were then practiced. Most of the people who were brought in um, were small scale uh, farmers focusing on irrigation. So this had a significant impact on water use within the county. And many people have attributed that to um, reasons why rivers have become depleted as they are today. Um, there's also, as I mentioned in the presentation, this legacy of the structural adjustment programs um, back in the 1970s and 80s. And that's had a, a long um, ongoing impact on um, the economic, socioeconomic situation within the county. Um, and then I guess the only other policy changes that I think would be useful to think about in this context is this shift that seems to be um, occurring from this sense of a, a kind of pessimistic narrative of migration as a failure to adapt and how that's increasingly shifting to this idea of migration as adaptation. And that's happening, I guess, more at a kind of international level and maybe more even at an academic level at the moment than a policy level. But it'll be interesting to see how those kinds of dynamics filter down and um, impact on communities that are mobile and diversified. I'll stop there. Thank you. Okay, great. Greta, very briefly. Um, yeah, I'll try. Thank you, Charles, for uh, your comments. I, I guess we can uh, talk about the, beside these two minutes that I've got. <laughs> Um, but very quickly, um, <laughs> hinging on uh, starting from Caitlin's response about the, the Community Land Act, I think that um, it's perhaps it's together with the other policy frameworks that are in Kenya, it, it's actually quite good, or there are uh, good elements in it. The particular of the Community Land Act, though, I feel that it still operates in, in a broader legal uh, framework of privatization as uh, ultimate goal. And it ends up kind of enclosing areas. This is the land of the Turkana. This is the land of the others. Uh, so it, it's dangerous in that way in, in breaking some of the fluidity and translocality that also Caitlin is, uh, uh, is, is mentioning about. So this brings me um, to, to touch to, to a few other things that you've mentioned. Is that there is a, there is a good scope there is a good base to to, uh, to, to you know to, to, to change uh, some of the interventions because there is momentum or, or there is a political narrative which is rising up um, but there is fundament there is a crucial need to understand the value of pastoralism and the value of dry land so to stop thinking in terms of degradation and uh, and uh, and poverty and this sort of things, but understand how it operates and then assist it. So um, when you said also other people that comes from the inland, like I think that the things to do is to guarantee that pastoralism is, can access land in the multiple places in which they need to access land in, diff in different times. Um, and I, and I got lost in my narrative, but like it's really important to recognize because like, what I want to say is that because this is the only way to really get uh, something out of the dry lands. It's not building, um, expanding irrigation schemes or agricultural development, which will inevitably fail as they have 
until now because it's not a system that works in that way sort of thing so now i'm also talk, touching on pad mini sorry comments so we need to recognize the value of pastoralists because what as what what uh, is said in the chat we need to understand that uncertainty and viability is actually okay, you go beyond the negative side of it and see it as, as an opportunity, but it's only an opportunity if we have a system that uh, go interface it and, and goes in the same yeah. direction. <laughs> Sorry, I'm kind of rambling. Great. I hope something was clear. Thank you. I want to, uh, that, 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 that's great. I, I just want to give, uh, I know Mara Bernardi has said she's got a question, but we don't know what it is. Um, so I wonder if you want to, to give your question, Mara. Thank you, yes, Oliver. Yeah. yeah, sorry I didn't write it because um, I was just so excited by Greta's presentation. I didn't know where to start, but I think I've got it structured. I can say it quickly. Um, basically, thank you so much for the presentation. And I really agree with your point that you just made about trying to see the value of the drylands and rather than the narrative of um, pastoralists as both causers and victims of climate change we need to look at how they can contribute to conserving um, and ca capturing carbon and so on and this at the same time as recognizing that there is more population and more livestock in those areas so there's still some uh, you know a big tension in what's happening so what i wanted to ask very practically was what do you think of some i'm going to say five interventions that we're looking at or that we do that we think address the issue but i i would really love to hear if you think that they're terrible or really good so um we've talked a lot about land and the community lands act so we've looked in particular uh, participatory rangelands management and other forms of land use planning and also sort of permitting cooperation for movement between counties and so on. Another thing we've looked at is animal health interventions, so animal disease prevention and those kinds of, let's say, public goods activities. One other one is livestock insurance, which actually in Kenya at present is still paid for totally by the government. So it's actually a sort of a shock responsive cash transfer program de facto, though it's meant to be changing. Um, response to disasters. So uh, we funded in the past and we still fund um, livestock feed after drought. So what do you think of that? And then finally, there's a lot of discussion about the cultural aspects where, uh, you know, livestock are considered wealth and they're not sold and so on, and that there should be a change in attitude to make it more of a, let's say, commodity or, um, or sellable uh, asset, uh, sellable in terms of making a profit rather than selling when you, when you need a saving. What do you think of that? Thank you. And to don't respond to all of it if it's too long. That, that might be a lot to respond to in the time we've got available, but it's a conversation I hope you can ca carry on. Yeah, after. exactly. Do, do, do Maybe, your best. Know, there was the, my email, I hope in the slides you can find me. I actually would uh, glad to know more about these programs that you uh, you mentioned, so I'm very happy to talk about it. I think in one uh, shots the first thing that comes to mind is uh, how much is the ownership and participation in the governance of this project that you mentioned coming from the communities you're working with but i think that some um, exercises that some studies by the ied sorry something uh, i will find it out they they have some evidence that wherever there was the ownership and the governance based on uh, the community uh, also, for the case of the locust invasion that Charles was talking about, they were not as impacted as other programs. So that maybe is one of the differences to look at. But we can um, talk about it. You can find me. <laughs> Thank you for the question. My thanks to um, Caitlin and Greta and Charles for their contributions, for, for sort of launching this discussion, and for the people who have been putting a lot of comments in the, in the chat. There's a few things we haven't touched on. I mean, the question's been raised about, um, everyone's touched on governance. There's been a lot of talk about governance. Um, but what, a, yeah, from a practitioner point of view, striking the limited accountability of government, private sector NGOs in past, working in pastoral areas. Yeah, how are we thinking about that? Um, there's also, I think, an important point raised about you know, just thinking, thinking back and understanding how interventions have affected um, over the years, how 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 they they have affected um, had unintended un sets of unintended consequences. Um, 
and how they've affected the adaptive capacities. And I think understanding those adaptive capacities is something you've really brought out in the way people are adapting. And, um, and something that really strikes me is the, uh, the fact you've highlighted the everyday mobility, the importance of everyday mobility as part of people in these inter intersection with people's livelihoods, the complex adaptations they, they do in their day-to-day -day lives. And as uh, you point out already, the, vari the role of variability, it, it is, Adapt, adapting to variability is a, a strength and um, and the other thing that really strikes me is it raises questions for me about um, root causes. You've all, you've all muddied the waters of what's environmental migration and challenged that idea and the idea of responding to climate change because it's actually the politics, it's the economics, there's all sorts of other issues. And that raises questions about root causes of mobility, which I know is something that a lot, a lot of programming sometimes gets concerned with. 